Hello and welcome back to another episode of Katie the Science Lady. I'm Mrs. Jacobson and today's topic is one that's very important for us to be understanding right now. It's viral replication. So let's learn together. Today we're going to be talking about viral replication. Now we touched on this last video just a little bit. We talked about those basic steps that a virus goes through in order to take over your cells and turn them into virus factories. But today we're gonna to talk about two of the specific ways that this happens. So there are two types of viral infection. The first one is lytic infections. Lytic infections happen just kind of like we outlined in the last video. The virus enters the cell, it makes copies of itself, and then it explodes or bursts out of the cell, which kills your cell. Now the scientific term for exploding out of a cell or causing a cell to explode is lysis. It just sounds more exciting to me. And I kind of like to be excited when I talk about biology. So exploding is the word I'm going to use, but the real term is lysis. The second type of viral infection is lysogenic. Now it's a little bit different. In this one, the virus enters the cell, but that virus DNA actually becomes part of your host cell's DNA. It gets hidden so well that the virus can stay dormant. Um, think of dormir, like asleep in Spanish. It stays asleep and hidden in your cells, sometimes for months, sometimes years. Um, a lot of lysogenic infections do lie dormant for many years and people will not know that they have them um, until it's honestly too late. Once that uh, the viral DNA is copied, because it's in your cell and part of your cell's DNA, it gets copied every time your cell divides. So if you have one cell that has it, suddenly that cell becomes two. And if those two cells have your viral DNA, when they divide, you get four, and so on and so on. It's exponential. Every time your cell divides, you get two or more new cells that have that viral DNA inside them. Now, the lying dormant part is not the issue. If it's dormant, that means it's not doing anything to your body. It's just part of your DNA that's not affected. The problem is it can turn lytic. So as soon as that lysogenic infection turns lytic, your cells will start to make copies of the virus and then they will burst out of your cell all at once. So instead of just having one or two cells that were infected in a lytic infection, you may have thousands or millions of cells infected with a lysogenic infection. And if all those thousands or millions of cells explode at the same time, you're gonna be feeling really, really crummy for a while. And here, of course, is an example of a new virus leaving your cell. It starts to take up that cell membrane and glycoproteins, or we call that the envelope from our last video. And it's going to slowly leave your cells, cell membrane, with that nice outer coating, that kind of yellowish, peachish part that's your own cell membrane and glycoproteins. It steals it and then leaves your cell to die. Viruses are kind of ruthless. Here's a visual description of both of the types of infection. Lytic, again, you can see it's pretty simple. We have an example here with a bacteriophage, my favorite type of virus, uh, and a bacterium. So that bacteriophage injects the DNA or RNA into the bacterium. It gets replicated viruses get assembled, kind of like a little factory, and then it bursts out of the cell, killing it. Lysogenic is slower. So we've got the host cell DNA here. So that's what we've got in here. It's a bacterium, so it's a single loop of DNA or circular DNA. Once that virus injects the DNA, it becomes part of the bacterial cell's virus, or in other cases, your cells, um, your cell's genome, your genes. Every time this, for this example, this bacterial cell divides, you can see that there's a copy of the virus genetic information in every single new cell. Again, it's not a problem up to this point right here. Right when we're at this point here, your cells are fine. They don't have any symptoms. There's nothing wrong with them. Everything's good. But once it turns lytic and your cells start to assemble the new viruses, they start to replicate the viral DNA. Once that starts to happen and you actually start building the viruses in the cells, you're in trouble. Because now instead of having one cell that's bursting, 
you have hundreds or thousands or millions of your cells that are all bursting at the same time. So again, lysogenic, this is definitely the slower cycle. I remember it by saying lyso equals slow because it can take years. On the other hand, lytic, um, the only thing I've ever found to rhyme with that is lytic is quick and it's going to happen very rapidly. And our first example here is influenza or the flu. Pretty much everybody's had the flu at some point in their life, so this should kind of ring true. Here's an example of what the uh, influenza virus could look like. It's a spherical virus. You've got your DNA or RNA on the inside. You've got your capsid, you've got your envelope. And along the outside here, we have all these glycoproteins that can attach to uh, cells, especially in our throat and our respiratory system. Its main job is to attack and kill respiratory cells. The glycoproteins work really well on our respiratory cells, on the cells of our throat and nose. And that causes our flu-like symptoms, our scratchy throat, our sneezing, our coughing, all of those symptoms are caused by this type of virus. It spreads fast and is copied very, very quickly. Usually when you get the flu, you got it from somebody at school or a family member, and you start feeling crummy within 24 to 48 hours. You feel sick and you feel those symptoms pretty quickly. This is a lytic virus. So influenza is a lytic virus because it's fast. And now I don't mean it kills somebody quickly. I mean, it starts to replicate quickly and you start feeling those symptoms quickly. On the other hand, HIV is not a quick acting virus. So HIV, here's a picture of the HIV. You've got on the inside here, your um, DNA or RNA. You've got again, your capsid is kind of small on this one. And then you've got your envelope and glycoproteins on the outside. So same structure, um, just looks a little bit different. It attacks and kills cells of the immune system. So the HIV virus isn't going to affect your respiratory system. Those glycoproteins work best on cells of the immune system. This one takes years to cause illness. Um, this is why for a long, long time, people that had HIV didn't know there was anything wrong with them because they wouldn't feel sick. Um, they wouldn't show any symptoms, but as soon as they started showing symptoms, they would die very, very quickly. Um, and that's because the HIV would start turning lytic, which is essentially AIDS. So HIV is the human immunodeficiency virus. And for immuno, we can tell that it affects the immune system. Once this virus turns lytic and starts essentially bursting all of your cells, that's the death of the immune cells. And it leads to AIDS. AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And at that point, we don't call it a virus anymore because the virus has already done its damage. At that point, your immune systems are dying in such large quantities that there's not that much that can be done. All of the HIV cures or treatments you may have heard about, those all deal with freezing the virus in its dormant state. They don't want it to get to AIDS because once it does, it's very, very difficult to treat. Um, they want to stop it while it's still trying to replicate and just freeze it in that form. And it usually works pretty well. This is a lysogenic virus. Again, the key here, lyso, is slow. It takes years to develop. People probably don't know they have it for a long time. Um, and that's why it is lysogenic. Another topic we do need to talk about are vaccines. You've, I'm sure you've heard in the news, people are trying to come up with a vaccine for COVID-19. There are hundreds of research facilities trying to figure out this vaccine quickly so that um, life can go back to fairly normal. Um, but we'll talk about more traditional vaccines because as of right now, we don't know what a COVID-19 vaccine could look like or would look like because we honestly don't know that much about the virus yet. But we're gonna talk about some more basic vaccines like a flu vaccine. Vaccines are used to give immunity against viral infections, and they usually contain a damaged or a weakened form of the virus. So your body is able to fight it off without either without symptoms or with very minimal symptoms. The goal is to give you protection from a virus without actually making you have to go through having the full on virus. And what this does when you have a weakened or a damaged form of the virus in your system, it allows your immune system, the system that fights off these invaders, to tag it um, and they essentially say hey this that's bad let's get rid of that anytime we see it in the future so your body doesn't have to wonder what's happening 
it just tags it and says, yep, this one's to be destroyed. We don't want this in our body. Now, before I move on, I get this uh, question asked every year from students. Um, there is no scientific evidence that I, autism is linked to vaccination. There was, in the mid-1990s, a scientific paper published that said that there might be a link. This paper has now been disproven hundreds of times. Um, it was, that person that wrote it was thrown out of science. Um, it was widely discredited. But for some reason, people like to bring up a bad article over and over again. Um, I believe people today would refer to it as fake news. Um, there is no scientific evidence that would link these two things together. I want to quickly talk, um, just to end today, with how um, a, a vaccine really helps you not get sick from a specific virus. So we're going to kind of talk our way through this, and hopefully it becomes a little bit clearer. So in this first panel here, the vaccine virus is going to cause a pig's immune system to produce antibodies, but doesn't make the pig sick. So I'm not using humans as an example here. We're talking about just a pig. So if you give a pig a vaccine, um, it's got the vaccine here, Your, its bodies produce antibodies. So the pig, its body is like, ooh, this is bad. Let's, let's try and fight it off. So now the pig has these antibodies that are programmed to fight off that virus, that weakened form um, that was given to the pig as the vaccine. So now, even though the pig didn't get sick, it made the antibodies. So it's still programmed to fight that virus. Now, the next time the pig gets infected with the virus, they may pick it up in its pig journey somewhere. Um, but if it gets exposed to the actual virus, it has those antibodies. And those antibodies prevent the pig from getting sick because it recognizes the virus already. So even though it hadn't seen the virus before, it had seen the same virus, but weakened or in a different form. The key here are the antibodies. When we talked about how your body tags a virus, this is how it does it. It creates antibodies that are designed to help you fight off that virus no problem. So that the next time you get the virus, you may not even feel like you've been sick, which is a good thing. Let's recap these two viral life cycles. First off, we have lytic. Lytic is a very quick life cycle and occurs in viruses like the flu. And here's what happens. The virus enters a host cell, integrates its DNA with the host cell DNA, uses that host cell to make copies of itself, and then those newly formed viruses burst out of the cell, killing the host cell. On the other hand, lysogenic life cycles are much slower and they take more time to develop, but they start out pretty much the same. The viral DNA is still integrated into the host cell DNA, but then it changes and it lies dormant. So that viral DNA is not going to get made into small viruses yet, but it stays there. So every time the host cell replicates, the viral DNA replicates as well. Now this can take years. So after years, you may have thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of this viral DNA hiding in your cells. And then all of a sudden, it can turn lytic. And all thousands of those cells can burst at once, causing a little bit more mayhem than the lytic life cell process. Thank you for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe for more biology videos. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something. And I'll see you later.